Love is one of the fundamental things that makes us human. Whether it be between parent and child, brother and sister, pet and owner, man and woman, man and man, woman and woman, etc, etc, etc. It's so fundamental to our experience that all art forms have to tackle it at some point. It's subject matter for books, TV, movies, music, and even video games. But that doesn't mean that it's often tackled well. Love is an emotion that's almost never presented in a way that feels genuine. It's always presented in this inherently positive context. But anyone who's experienced love knows that that isn't true. Love breeds frustration and anger almost as often as it inspires and uplifts. Put more simply, if you haven't contemplated murder, you ain't been in love. The audience laughed because what he said is a truism, a self-evident or obvious truth. Now he's certainly talking about romantic relationships, but it goes for any relationship, really. Why is this emotion that everyone blows flowers up your ass about so inherently frustrating? Because love is about relinquishing your agency to someone or something and hoping that it doesn't hurt you. Yet the fact of the matter is, a thinking thing isn't always going to act how you expect it to act. This goes for people as well as animals. Children disappoint point parents, and dogs can sometimes do things that force their owners to put them down. How do you systemize that? In a medium about agency, how do you systemize an emotion which fundamentally strips you of agency? This is the problem that games have been haphazardly trying to tackle for years. Games usually rely on context built outside of gameplay to build an emotional connection, stuff like story and dialogue. Looking at gameplay, and only gameplay, games usually treat relationships in a way that feels sociopathic. The philosopher Immanuel Kant once said, People are not a means to an end. They are an end in and of themselves. I believe this wholeheartedly, but games usually treat characters outside of the player as a means to an end. In many cases, you can just take control or directly order during gameplay. Some games try to fool you into thinking you're building a relationship with dialogue choices, but really, you're just fulfilling criteria to open up options. Then, there are the games that give you companions who are beyond your control, but who are just genuinely irrelevant to the game as a whole. If games are about experience, then handling NPC relationships this way means that you never experience any kind of bond with them. You're just told you have a bond with them. Peter Molyneux went on at length, as he usually does, about the dog for Fable 2, espousing the fact that you didn't have control over the dog. So let's show you how you control the dog. How do you control the dog? Well, uh, we did consider, not for very long, but we did consider that the blue button could be run, um, send, the yellow button could be wait, the red button could be attack, the green button could be um, dig, the down could be sniff, and and then we thought, this is madness, it doesn't feel like a dog feels like a robot. So we threw all that away and said, you do not control your dog by using anything on the controller at all. You've got to think of another way. Because he's got to feel like a dog, a real dog. And real dogs don't have buttons. The problem was that it didn't matter that you didn't have control over the dog. It never affects your ability to play, so why should you care whether or not you have control over the dog? Same goes for characters like Elizabeth from Bioshock or Ellie from The Last of Us. For the longest time, I would have called The Last of Us gaming's best instance of trying to represent love, even if it was just on a familial level. But The Last Guardian blows it out of the fucking water. You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. That's because The Last Guardian has the balls to tie progression to an AI that you can direct but never control. Whether or not you progress is entirely dependent on Trico, and there are times where he just won't go to the obvious place that you're trying to get him to go. In this instance, the fact that you can't control Trico, coupled with how important he is to progression, makes the relationship that you forge more meaningful. 
Eventually, you'll understand what makes him tick. You'll understand his fears, his abilities, and can kind of grasp how he sees the world. You need to understand these things in order to progress. The mechanic is a relationship. In one instance, he even overcomes a crippling fear to save you, making his actions have more meaning because they aren't always bound by a system. Though, let's not mince words. From a pure gameplay perspective, The Last Guardian is frustrating, and I, by and large, would not recommend it. If you're looking for a fun old responsive time of hacking and killing, play something like Bloodborne instead. This game is about you. It's introspective. It asks you to be patient with both the game itself and Trico. And even I, as much as I loved the experience, lost patience every once in a while. I'm looking at you, water section. The boy you control is a strange kind of double-jointed ragdoll whose momentum you are continually fighting. And like I said, you can't control Trico with any degree of certainty. To enjoy this game, you have to be happy with just existing in a space with this thing. You have to be patient enough to let Trico go the wrong way, or build up his confidence to do something. That's what this game really is, a test of patience. There's no real difficulty to speak of beyond that. However, the reward for passing this test is a bond. I've never been a fan of the idea that an ending could make or break something. I've always found meaning to be way more important than how something ended. However, in the case of The Last Guardian, the ending contextualized the entire experience. As I ended the game with a final button press, I was weeping, practically begging the game not to end. It was at this point that I realized what this thing is about. This is going to sound kind of hyperbolic, but in my entire life outside of my parents, I've only ever loved twice, a woman and a pet. Both times were filled with frustration and reward. Both times it ended in a way that fucked me up. In finishing The Last Guardian, I have experienced this emotion for a third time. Yes, the imagery was fantastical and the gameplay was frustrating, but the experience drove to the core of what it means to be human. It's a transcendent piece of work that single-handedly justifies the medium. If you have the time, and most importantly the patience, you need to play this at some point in your life. <laughs> 